Hello, everyone. I'm Leonel August Rodriguez, the VP of Business Development for Access Medical Labs. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us on another Access Live, where we bring you insight from leading medical experts. We do ask that all questions are submitted via the Q&A, as it will be answered at the end of our lecture. So today, we have a, a very special individual who has close to 30 years of experience as a physician, and he is no stranger to Access Live. He is the Medical Director of On Point Medicine and Total Nutrition Technology, and he is a very good friend. Without further ado, Dr. Jerry Ferris. Good evening, and thank you, Leo. Always a pleasure to appear on Access Live and, you know, try, try to give some pearls of wisdom out there. Absolutely. Um, tonight, we are going to talk about a topic that is really, really in the news. Um, I'm going to hopefully give you some clinical pearls along the way on how um, we are doing it and what we're achieving with it. So um, the only thing I will throw out that's very interesting in, in the land I am from, it is Fat Tuesday. Um, so I'm from New Orleans, Louisiana. At this point, most of those people are uh, have had too much to drink and too much to eat. So I think it's interesting. I'm going to talk about obesity and weight loss. So these new medications are are they are they hype or are they hope? Let's let's dig in and explore it. Okay, <clears throat> first of all, we got to define the scope of the obesity um, epidemic. Right, obesity is really a chronic relapsing, multifactorial, neurobehavioral disease, wherein an increase in body fat promotes adipose tissue dysfunction and abnormal fat mass physical forces resulting in metabolic, biomechanical, and psychosocial health consequences. That's a mouthful, right? So the problem is obesity is complex, right? It's not just calories in, calories out. There's a whole lot more to it. I, I, I read that, that that's actually from uh, the professor of the, the bariatric clinic at Yale Medicine. I thought it was just, it encompasses everything. So we're going to tonight, we're going to talk about the factors involved in obesity and weight loss. What is weight loss? What are medications for weight loss? And then we'll explore the, the GLP-1 inhibitors, which are really the hot topic. That's semaglutide and drizapatide. So current CDC da data shows at least 40% of the adults are obese. If, if you expand that, there is close to 70% that are overweight. So this is epidemic proportion. That number is expected to increase 50% by 2030. That's just mind boggling. And then you look at 60 years ago, the rate of obesity was 13%. So how did we get here, right? You look at it by the numbers, as we had talked about, the obesity rate has increased in the last 60 years. We're spending $1.2 billion in obesity research. The the cost of obesity is $173 billion. And we don't even take into account all the cardiovascular disease that goes with it. So it it's a, you know, there, there is it is a big, big problem. If you start to look at this, and this comes from CDC data, if you look back in 1990, and again, part of this has to do with the food pyramid, which was put out in 1978, which really was erroneous and not supported by data. But you can tell looking in 1990, we didn't really have much of a problem of obesity. And then you fast forward to 2010 and more modern days. There's very few states that don't have obesity. And it looks even worse now than it ever did before. We can't just look at obesity because ob obesity leads to metabolic syndrome. It leads to diabetes. It leads to diabetes that ends up being insulin resistant and requiring insulin, and it leads to cardiovascular disease. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. Here are the effects. Sure, it's not just getting obese, it's diabetes, it's cardiovascular disease, it's joint pain and arthritis. People are miserable, they can't move about. It affects our longevity. And now we're starting to see increased research that obesity can lead to cognitive decline leading to dementia. So the scope of the problem is not just we're overweight. How do we get there? Well, diet is clearly one of the major 
sources of, of obesity. And again, part of it was because we, we received erroneous data in 1978 in the form of the food pyramid. Now we've gone to a food plate. We're starting to get a little more idea that we just cannot eat processed carbohydrates. You know, we need to be eating more fruits and vegetables. Um, we need to a attack the problem of fast food. So diet is critical. Sedentary lifestyle. Well, again, most people are spending a lot of time in front of the computer, on their phones. We're not as active. We don't promote uh, a lifestyle where, where, where there's a lot of activity. And as you become more and more overweight, it becomes so much more difficult. We must talk about obesogens. These are chemicals in the environment, chemicals in food. Um, these are things that are causing us to become obese by the nature of what they are. They truly are toxins. We have to at least um, talk about the microbiome because we know all disease begins and ends in the gut. So if we don't have a healthy microbiome, we now become a setup for this obesity. Hormonally, definitely plays a part. And then epigenetics definitely plays a part. So if you if you look at, again, just another slide, if you'll notice our food supply really has not changed. Our food intake has really not changed from 2000 to 2018, but yet our, our obesity has really had an upward trajectory. So it's really the foods we are eating, these ultra processed foods, these foods that are high in sugar, they're high in calories, they're nutritionally deficient. This is what's contributing to the obesity epidemic. And now, again, these, these companies make food that tastes good so that it actually starts to stimulate the, the brain as a pleasure center. So again, the, they're smart. They understand food psychology more than you and I do. So how do we deal with weight loss? We've already talked about it. I gave you the, that extremely long, complex definition of obesity. And there is, there is the, the, this to say that it's just calories in, calories out, that is correct, but it's more than that, okay? It's also the sedentary lifestyle. We must identify, are there some contributing factors that are perpetuating weight, okay? Other thing we need to look at is information. Remember, knowledge is power. The more people, the more people know, the more they can act on themselves. The less they know, and again, there's a lot of false information out there. When we do it, we we always recommend coaching. It is so advantageous. I mean, I work for a nutrition company, and we get a lot of success because we coach people, we hold their hand, we teach them how to eat right, and this is paramount than just saying, well, you need to go do this. You, they really need help because they're not getting this information in a correct way. We're going to explore tonight natural therapies, and then finally we are going to touch on medications. These are the four pillars of weight loss. We have to deal with nutrition. Again, too much of our diet is nutritionally poor, but caloric in excess. So people are getting plenty, plenty calories and poor nutrition. And, and then the body, because of the poor nutritional status, does not run in an efficient manner. The other piece is inflammation. We know that all the disease comes from an inflammatory response. So we, we, you know, if you've ever been to an A4M conference, they always talk about inflammation as the source of everything. And the the more you're inflamed, the more you're going to struggle. We must at least look at hormone restoration because there are certain hormones in your body. We can talk about them, ghrelin, leptin, thyroid, and then the sex hormones that are all can be contributory to this as well as cortisol. And, you know, we all know cortisol can be a bad player in the game. And the last piece is mind-body. You really have to incorporate um, positive affirmations in these people because weight loss is a tremendous struggle it's very hard okay so we have to incorporate you know positive affirmations positive thinking because it's a struggle and they will struggle along the way so we have to be there for our patients i like to do laboratory evaluation so this is part of it i want to know what am i what am i walking into before i start treating a patient so that on the back end, 
somewhere down the road, we can show the same profile. Because again, we want to show there is improvement on these biomarkers. So a simple weight loss panel could be a CBC, a fasting insulin, which I find to be a very fascinating thing if you're not running it. Obviously, a comprehensive, comprehensive metabolic profile. We'll attack this later because one of the side effects is biliary disease. So we want to look at liver functions. We would like to look at lipids because, again, most of these people are moving towards metabolic syndrome. Thyroids, because, again, a malfunctioning thyroid or an underactive thyroid or Hashimoto's will all be contributory to uh, the obesity problem and lack of success. We like to look at B12 and obviously want to look at hemoglobin A1C. If, if you said, and I don't tell you to cut corners, but you really have to look at fasting insulin, you have to look at hemoglobin A1C. Um, I will tell you, Access does a really nice panel on this. So let's start to get into the therapies of this. We can go natural, and I love to go natural when natural is available to us. Berberine, again, some people will say that's nature's metformin. Berberine, been studied for 50 years, very safe, has very good effects on both lipid metabolism as well as glucose metabolism. We can use chromium. Chromium is an adjunct to diabetic or insulin metabolism. Gymnet, gymnema sylvestri, um, white kidney bean extract, Garcinia camboglia, green tea, and forskolin. So these things are out there. They do work. That can't say they work for everybody. Some are binders, some are stimulants, um, some are antioxidants. So again, you can use these in combination with some of the other things we will talk about later. But again, I always liked, especially while I'm dealing with malfunctions and lipid metabolism, I love berberine, okay? I love using green tea. Those are probably my two big go-tos out of this panel. Let's start to talk about medical interventions. Phentermine or Adapex has been the go-to for many, many years. Um, what Adapex do is it basically is a metabolic stimulator so that it upregulates your metabolism. It makes you very thirsty. It decreases your appetite. Phentermine is very, very effective. It does have some side effect profiles that have to be monitored. Not everybody should go on Phentermine. The next one is topiramate or topamax originally came out as an anti-seizure drug. We find that it's very efficacious with cravings. A little topiramate, 25 to 50 milligrams at night can go a long ways if your patient is one of those that gets into food cravings and can also be helpful um, when they get into emotional eating. Another one is the combination of bupropion and, and naltrexone. Sorry, I didn't spell it correctly. These are another one out there. Naltrexone, you're starting to see over and over again. This is not low-dose naltrexone, though. But again, working on that opiate uh, receptor can be very, very effective. Bupropion classically was used in an antidepressant. So again, we're going to start to see that a lot of this stuff is working on the cerebral aspect of why people get heavy, because if you can stop the craving, stop the desire, you can start to control their appetite a little bit better and control portions and the amount of calories. HCG, very classic, old, older use drug. I still use it on occasion. Unfortunately, it has become very difficult to source and the expense has gone up. I will tell you, I did never believe in the HCG diet because 500 calories is really going to cause somebody to yo-yo. So again, we do use a HCG on occasion, but we tend to use some calorie restriction, but not to the degree of the famous HCG diet. Lipotropics, this is the, the, the combinations of B vitamins and choline and um, that you can, you can use. These things are very effective. Again, stimulation of energy, can start to increase some lipid metabolism. Now, Trexone, again, we've talked about it. You can use it orally. You can use it as an implant. So we start to see that we do have a pretty big toolbox to start to, and this is a, the old toolbox. And now we're going to talk about the new toolbox. 
The original one was actually liraglutide. We, you could still, that's the drug Saxenda, diabetic drug, but that was sort of the original GLP-1 agonist. And then they came out with semaglutide. Um, for this purposes, I will not use, for, for the most part, I will use the, the, not the trade name, I will use the generic name. So semaglutide, again, um, is what's called a GLP-1 agonist. The next one that came out is terzepatide, which is now adds not just a GLP-1, but a GIP or gastric inhibitory. Um, um, I'm sorry, blanking on that. Um, peptide, I'm sorry. And had, had, a, had a senior moment there. And then the, the newest one that's coming out is this retor retoratide, which is now a three-prong. So it's a GLP-1, a GIP, and then a glucagon. Um, the studies on these are actually pretty groundbreaking. But we still have other things. What about metformin? What about butyrate? Things that, what about oxytocin? All these things can trigger the AMPK. And we, if you've been to any conference, you'll know that stimulation of AMPK is really important. Metformin, I've seen help people not only lower their blood sugar, but lose weight. It's, um, it's, it's a very cheap an easy way to do it if it's tolerated. AOD 9604, I have used it, not one of my favorites. It's AOD is anti-obesity drug. That is a peptide. Tesofensine, which I've used a fair amount of. Again, another peptide. It, I, what I like about tesofensine is tesofensine is a drug that tends to work on the cerebral component. And that's where I really think where some of the ground we need to work on is how do we get people to not think they're hungry? Because if you can attack that piece, then we can have some success. And I find tesofensine is, is a great adjunct um, to weight loss. Again, it's not as powerful, but it can work very well. And the last one is MOTC. Really some good research on MOTC. MOTC is an injectable. Unfortunately, it is a bit expensive. So let's, since really tonight we were going to talk about the GLP-1s, Let's talk about semaglutide a little bit. It's called an incretin, okay? Because it stimulates the increase in insulin. So basically we skip more insulin. This way you start to feel full. It starts to control appetite at the gut level. It starts to control cravings at the cerebral level. It slows emptying time from the stomach so you feel full. That's going to be a good thing, but that's going to be a bad thing. It's going to increase resting energy expenditure. Anything we, where we burn more energy, we win, and it can improve sleep. Okay, so that's the basis behind what it works. Terzepatide, again, in, increases the, it reduces insulin secretion. Now it also stimulates glucagon secretion and, and fat accumulation, and it can influence this brain problem. Okay, again, this is where I think the work needs to be done. When we can start to regulate appetite, satiety from a cerebral le level, we start to have some real, real um, chance to win at this thing. And then it's been shown to do bone remodeling. I will tell you on all the new studies, they're starting to use these for other things besides just insulin resistance, diabetes, and now weight loss. So semaglutide, it was it really, we thought it was the game changer. And I think it's a generational drug initially approved for diabetics. It does have potent weight loss effects. In the one major study, it showed there was almost a 15% weight loss at 68 weeks. That's a significant amount of weight. 32% of the, the patients lost 20% in that study, and 70% and lost at least 10%. So that's a huge win. Now, that was a study that went on for 68 weeks. If in one of the comments you'll hear me talk about, the drug makers would like you to prescribe this for your patient for the rest of their lifetime. But it does have side effects. Nausea is the big one. This is the, if you can make it through the first two weeks of what we found at the low dose, you tend to do well. Things that can help is using um, Zofran B6 can be helpful. It can cause diarrhea. It can cause vomiting. It can cause constipation. Remember, it is slowing down gastric emptying. Okay. It can cause abdominal pain. It can cause pancreatitis. It can cause headache and fatigue. This is why when we consult on our patients on whether to enter this, we make it very clear you cannot eat the standard American diet and go on semaglutide or drosapatide. You are a setup for a, for a complication 
Thus, you have to eat clean because we're not going to be able to empty our stomach. Thus, things are going to back up. And this is where we start to get into the ileus and the bowel obstructions and all the, the horror stories that you hear with semaglutine. What are the what are the warnings? Again, there's a if you have a person or a family history of medullary thyroid cancer, um, if you have pancreatitis, because again, it's working on insulin, and if you've had a prior bowel obstruction. Um, they've redone the study at three years, and nobody on semaglutide thus far has developed any kind of endocrine neoplasia. So that's it's getting a little more uh, of a safety profile. Here's the problem. It's expensive. I mean, it's really expensive. This was, a, this, the, the, it originally was around 1500. You can really get it down to between 900 and 1300 a month. The big problem is now insurance doesn't want to cover, cover it. I live in the state of North Carolina. The teacher's health plan was covering it and they have ceased covering it because of the cost of it. So cost is one of the big inhibitors with semaglutide. And then the other problem is that there was a 44% incidence of nausea severe enough to cause discontinuation of the regimen. And again, if you do enough of this, you will see this. We have several patients that just say, I, I really want to lose weight, but I can't handle the nausea. So you have to, you have to prepare them for this. You have to use your antiemetics and B6 and things to try to alleviate that nausea. The other problem is that two thirds of the patients regained weight after they, they discontinued this. Part of this, I think, was because they were not being coached. Remember, we went back to the coaching, how to deal with what was you, what was you, what are you going to do nutritionally if you come off of this? Because you can't continue to eat that standard American diet. So again, it's, it's really sad if they spent a bunch of money, lost a bunch of weight, and then went back and yo-yoed again. The other thing is you lose lean muscle. We, we, because it mimics starvation. So we tell all of our people, you need to lift weights while you're doing this. This is the ozempic phase, right? You you lose um, muscle mass because you're basically catabolizing the body. Dietary indiscretion, again, we can beat this one up all we want. If you do not eat a clean diet on these drugs, you will have problems. You may get away for a little while, but you're not going to get away long term. The other problem is that nobody really has a disease that these drugs are treating. Well, we're using it for diabetes, but we don't have a GLP-1 deficiency. We have an obesity and a weight problem, but not a GLP. So again, there's that ethical piece. And are drugs really bypassing the real problem? So again, in my clinic, we give you nutritional support as well as giving you drugs. We don't just give you the drugs. I think that's what leads to success. And thus far... You know, this drug's been around four years, so we don't have any long-term data. Other problems, and again, I'm just, this is an opinion. There are too many online sites where you can punch the credit card, get the drug, and I don't feel you get monitored correctly. You don't get nutritional or dietary advice. Um, these medications are compounded, and we have seen some problems with the compounded medications, and I don't feel they give you long-term follow-up. So to me, as a clinician who's been doing this a long time, if you're going to do this, be a clinician, be a doctor, be a advanced practice, um, uh, you know, an APC and follow up on your patients, find out how they're doing. Don't just sell them the drugs. Conclusion, obesity is a complicated medical problem. Remember, it's multifactorial. It's neurobehavioral, okay? It's metabolic. And then we start to get into inflammatory things. So it is a real complex problem and needs to be treated as that. Success is based on the four pillars we, 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 we talked about early on. And the other thing that we've talked about is, you know, we've, the idea that we've got a shot for that. Now, in my clinic, I'm, I'm going to throw this out because this is the big pearl for tonight, is... We've been using semaglutide for about a year now. And I decided that what I was going to do was I'm trying to use lowest dose for shortest amount of time. Because I feel though we can really help people in using the lowest dose for the shortest period of time. And then you decrease your ability or, or decrease the, the complications. So 
we try not to, to maximize our dose more than a milligram every week. We do in, a, in some cases, but most of the time, we try to get to that ceiling of a milligram, try to keep them on there, try to teach them how to eat, get them to exercise, get them on a long-term life plan so that we can get them on, on the drug and then off the drug within six months to a year. Because we, I don't believe we should be using this drug for a lifetime on all of our patients. There are some patients that are going to need it for a lifetime, but in the weight loss or obesity arena, I, I find we can use um, it for a short period of time. So that's how we're doing. We've seen amazing success. I will start to finish with, this is uh, something I did recently, which was summited Mount Mitchell. And that's what it looked like. But the point of this is weight loss is an arduous journey. It's, it's a slippery slope. And you have to watch your footing on it. But if you're willing to stick with it, the view is well worth it. And that's the top of Mount Mitchell, 6,682 feet. And it's you can see about three states from there. Uh, at this point, I will take questions. I thank you for your attention. And I will turn this back over to Leo. Dr. Ferris, thank you again for such an educational uh, lecture. I'm a little jealous I did not get the uh, invite to a uh, hike Mount Mitchell with you, um, but we'll, we'll talk about that on a separate note. Uh, I'm just kidding. Uh, we we it's do have seven and a half hours and thirteen miles. It's a long day. Okay, okay, I'm up to the challenge. I know you are. <laughs> All right. Uh, we actually we have quite a few uh, very good questions sure. in the uh, in the Q and A. So the first one. Um, is how do you monitor your patients in your practice in GLP-1? Okay, that is a great question. So what we do, again, I the way we do it is I do initial blood work. I do a consult. They get medication for four weeks. I follow up at four weeks. Then they get additional medication for eight weeks. I follow up at eight weeks. At that point, we start to decide where are we in the journey at that at that 12-week point. I like to repeat my labs to show that biomarker improvement. Excellent. And what would you say are some of the challenges and maybe a limitations of using, you know, medications like semaglutide for weight loss, uh, as you mentioned? Again, the limitations I see, one, obviously, is the side effects of nausea. That is clearly there. The other thing is trying to get patients compliant that we want you, we want to teach you how to be well the rest of your life. So you do need that nutritional support. We, you know, you. It, this is the sad thing is if they don't get the nutritional support, they're going to go back to eating the same processed foods and go back down the same road. So again, this is the idea that you really want to incorporate, you want to have somebody in your staff that can coach them as well as me monitor them. Excellent. And we have someone that's praising you um, in the in the question section saying, well done. They've actually been using um, 200 points and have found the best dose to be with diet, exercise, et cetera, every five days, uh, no falling out. So it seems like this individual is staying on top of his patients post their uh, treatment and medication. So um, just wanted to throw that out there for you. I, I um, have Absolutely. Um, so the next question is... When when you made when you mentioned uh, the nausea right with semaglutide, uh, was it due to the B six or was it due to the semaglutide? Was it due to a combination? Um, we just want a little bit more clarity. Sure. Okay. So again, what happens now is you're giving a drug that's going to slow down gut function. So you're basically putting a crimp on the back end, so things are going to fill up into the stomach. All right, that's going to create some degree of nausea. And plus the drug does create nausea. B6 has been known to help alleviate nausea and it's a non-prescription. So we know that there's an expensive drug they give pregnant young ladies that has B6 in it and, and dicyclamine, okay? But B6 by itself, again, B vitamin, can be a great natural adjunct to quell some of that nausea. I hope that clarifies it. So B, B6 is helping you and it's not hindering you. But again, as we slow gut function down, we can create this nausea. 
Excellent. I'm going to, I'm going to go back to a uh, GLP. So uh, can a patient that has had gastric bypass take any GLP one drugs? Again, the question there is what type of gastric bypass did they have? Hmm. Okay. Right? I'm not saying no to it. I think it would definitely work because again, working on the cerebral aspect and we actually have somebody who's had, one of my patients has had bypass and is on semaglutide and is doing marvelously. Okay. Beautiful. So truly so just yes, so there's no, the there is no contraindication. I would just like to know whether it was a sleeve, whether it was a ruin. Why, what, what, what is your, what type of gastric bypass did you have? Because again, that creates another layer of nutrient deficiency. Excellent. Um, I'm hoping to get that answer uh, here in the Q and a for a follow-up um, on the topic of GLP have have you experienced any gluconeogenesis uh, with GLP-1 drugs? I have not. Again, I have. That's. I'm not saying it's not possible, but I have not. And again, uh, I think th the better you do with monitoring and teaching these people and keeping them on a clean diet, the less problem you're going to have with this. And on the topic of diet, uh, my favorite form of dieting, um, is it is it good to have a patient on a high protein diet to avoid the, um, you know, the degeneration of muscles? I, I don't think you need to have any more higher protein than before. Uh, again, it, it, if I was going to advocate for a diet, I would go plant-based just because the digestibility is so much greater and you can get plenty of, of protein in your lentils and, and your beans. Okay. What I can get concerned about if you start eating a lot of red meat, I'm not against red meat, but it takes a lot longer to digest. And remember we're shutting down the gut. So we don't want foods that are difficult to digest in the gut because they're not going to move, right? We want things that are going to digest really, really easily. And that's your fruits, vegetables, the natural plant sources. Okay. And, and okay. So on the topic of, you know, a plant-based diet, mm -hmm. uh, have you, have you identified um, any deficiencies in, in vitamins and minerals um, to those patients that have gone on a, on a, let's say um, a fruit vegetable type diet and are on semaglutide? Again, you got to follow your bees. I mean, those are your big ones. Folate, you usually don't get it, but again, some people um, can have some B12 deficiency going into it. So you have, that's why it's kind of good to know ahead of time. But again, the fruits and vegetables have a lot of B6 and B12. Um, we can see this if you go to a vegan diet, they can get def nutritionally deficient in zinc as well. Mm, okay. And I'm very interested to, to this one. Um, so are there any concerns around creatine with semaglutide? Uh, are we talking about creatine as in the supplement creatine? That's what it sounds like. So I I, I, I can't answer that one um, because I'm not using those two simultaneously. Mm -hmm. um, a again, part of the other thing that over my years of, of in medicine is that if you're going to take creatine, you have to stay hydrated. With semaglutide, um, terzepatide, and all these, you have to stay hydrated. So I think as long as your hydration is good, I don't see a problem with it. Okay. But I would not I would not put you on a five gram dose every day. Oh, fair enough. And do you monitor creatine at all, creatine levels while on semaglutide? Let's say in the event that uh, a patient is not on creatine, they are on semaglutide, uh, do you monitor the creatine levels at all? Does well, again, you would do a comprehensive metabolic profile on the back end, which would show you cre creatinine, which is, I think, what you're asking me, kidney function. You know what? Yes, they actually corrected themselves. Yes, it is creatinine, not yes. creatine. Okay. Uh, so great, great catch there. Yep. And thank you for correcting yourself in the... Uh, right. In the so again... Day. We don't see problems as long as you hydrate it. But again, is if, if you don't feel hungry and you have to, this is where, you know, I, I tell people, get the jug of water and try to finish it every day. Right? Because okay. remember, we're starting to shut you down at the brain level. So you don't want to intake anything. So, and we know these drugs do better when you're hydrated. So you have to stay hydrated. Obviously, if you get into a period of, a extended period where you're getting low hydration, your BUN is going to rise, your creatinine is going to rise.
right? And then that leads to electrolyte problems. And that leads to more nausea because we know when you get an elevated BUN leading to something called uremia, the major side effect is nausea. And going back to the topic of nausea, um, any any dosage recommendation for the B6 uh, to encourage with the nausea at all? No, just a, uh, uh, I don't remember that one off the top of my head, but again, just a, a standard dose of B6 can be helpful. Excellent. B12, and, I remember off the top of my head, B6, I don't for some reason. Okay. Excellent. Um, this uh, this may be a controversial one here. Oh, boy. Um, uh, yeah. The <laughs> What's your opinion on uh, having teenagers on uh, some glutide? Again, boy, there's a pro-con on that one. Again, I think we have a molecule now that can impact obese children so that they don't go down the pathway of disease, okay? What I worry about is we're not teaching them how to take care of themselves, right? So my, and again, I've had this conversation. I look at patients, and I'm like, boy, I really worry about putting you on this because you're going to be on it for a lifetime, okay? So again, from a scientific standpoint, it would work. It would change that person's life. The question is, how do you how do you ethically deal with the fact is he is this person going to be on this for another fifty years? Hmm. If they're not taught, okay, you can't you you know you can't eat junk food, right? How do you teach a teenager? Well, you can't have junk food. Yeah, that that's a it's a tough one. <laughs> that's a real tough one. But again, we have a drug that works. And have you, I guess, are there any chances of permanently lowering someone's metabolism while on semaglutide? Well, you're clearly lowering someone's metabolism. Um, that's my fear. And again, remember, we don't have long-term data yet. We've got four years of study. Mm. That is, again, that's back to my original concern is I would prefer you not to be on this drug for a lifetime unless you have uh, some diabetic problems that have to be corrected for a long period of time. If we're going to truly use it for, for weight loss, I think to me, the better way is we come up with a plan, we're going to use it for X amount of time, see if we can get you off of it or to the lowest dose possible. Excellent. That is my opinion, though. Okay. And uh, I would say this may be my favorite question of the night. Uh, what labs do you recommend? I know you mentioned um, your chemistries or your CMP. Uh, well, aside from that, what other labs would you recommend for someone who no, is on some of the Again, you, you have to look at liver functions because it does have a risk of biliary problems. Okay. So liver functions are a, a, a mandate. You would love to show the biomarkers of insulin and A1C. So I find those to be very good. Okay. Most of these people have abnormal lipid metabolism, so a basic cholesterol panel, because if you show them they're getting better, they'll be more bought into it. I don't think that you have to have an exotic number of, of labs unless you have clinical suspicion that they have nutrient deficiencies. Um, again, this is a... Uh, Access has a great little panel. It covers everything you need to look and monitor your patients. If you want to dig deeper, please do. But you all run a great panel that really covers all the bases that a clinician needs to monitor this drug. Excellent. So th thank you for that. I truly appreciate it. Um, I saved my favorite and the best question for last. Um, so again, Dr. Ferris, you know, I truly appreciate having you on Access Live. Thank you once again, you know, for an amazing lecture on obesity and weight loss. Um, to the audience, you know, th thank you again for tuning in to Access Live, where we bring you insight, you know, from leading medical experts. Uh, don't forget to like, don't forget to subscribe, don't forget to stay healthy. If you want to get a hold of Dr. Ferris, his information is on the screen. Thank you all. Until next time.